Good afternoon and welcome to the event. My name is Molly Martin and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis. New America is a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank located in DC, but I make my home in Indiana and do my work across the Midwest. Welcome to Yes, You Can Vote, the first in a series of conversations New America Indianapolis will be having about voting rights, voter access, and the folks who make it possible. We're so happy to be here today with our partners at the Indianapolis Recorder and with my co-moderator, Oshia Boyd, who is the editor of the Indianapolis Recorder and also of Indiana, Indiana Minority Business Magazine. We're joined today by Ashley Taruno at our partners of the ACLU of Indiana and Ashley is the community engagement and policy advocate there. Uh, we're also so pleased and honored to be joined by Rod Bohannon who is the co-chair of the Legal Redress Committee of the Greater Indianapolis NAACP. Today's conversation is meant to be informative but also interactive so I hope that you are planning on asking us some questions in the chat. You can also join us on Twitter with the hashtag yes you can vote so please share your questions at any time. But first, I'd like to hand off to my co-moderator, Oshia, to tell us a little bit more about herself, about the recorder, and to introduce our panels. Thank you, Molly. It's a pleasure to be back on the air with you. <laughs> so, this, so again, my name is Oshia Boyd. I'm editor of the Indianapolis Recorder newspaper and Indiana Minority Business Magazine. The Recorder is a 125-year-old African-American-owned newspaper started in 1895 as a two-page church bulletin. Um, Indiana Minority Business Magazine is a 16-year-old magazine focused on diversity, uh, lifestyle, and business magazine. Uh, and it goes all across the state, unlike The Recorder, which focuses on Indianapolis's Black community. And this issue of voting is very important, obviously, to the recorder. Um, as we know that our sisters fought for this right for us to vote for many, many years, um, we still are still in the struggle since it's seen under the areas that they're trying to oppress and suppress people's voting rights. Um, so we want to have our voices heard and vote that. So, um, I want to also say that this is the way we participate in government. We we rep, we vote for who we want to represent us in our interests, and that's why voting is so vital to our community. So thank you, Molly. Excellent. Well, let's get started with our guests today. So we have with us Rod Bohannon of the Greater Indianapolis Chapter of the NAACP and Ashley Taruno in Community and Policy Advocacy at the Indiana ACLU. So Ashley, I'm going to come to you first and ask you to tell us a little bit about your organization and why you would be at the table when we're talking about voting rights. Definitely. Well, thank you all so much for having me today, and I'm excited for this conversation. Um, like you said, we're, I'm with the American Civil Liberties Union of Indiana. We're a national nonprofit, um, nonpartisan organization uh, dedicated to um, defending your civil our civil liberties and our con constitutional rights. Um, so we we do that. We like to say we do it in in the state house, in the courts, in the streets. Um, we, we protect people's rights um, in, in a lot of forms, and we've been around for about 100 years um, protecting people's rights across the country. So we have affiliates in every state. Um, we're the Indiana affiliate located in Indianapolis, but serve all of Indiana. Um, and yeah, we fight for voting rights all year round um, on an election year, not on an election year. Um, we're, we're always dedicated to make sure um, everyone can exercise their right to vote um, because we know the strength of, in our democracy lies in every American um, exercising that right to vote. Thank you so much, Ashley. So Rod, people might know a little bit about the NAACP or they might not. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about the organization and why you would be at a table when we talk about protecting voter rights. Okay, thank you. The uh, NAACP was founded in 1919. We're more than 100 years old. We have uh, chapters in all states. We have chapters in South Africa, England, um, South Korea. There's a new chapter being formulated in Syria, which is interesting. And so we're all over the country and we're all over the world as a model to deal with issues of civil rights. Civil rights are all, we do everything from educational issue, housing issue, house discrimination, uh, the advocacy for, for, for um, equal justice under the law, criminal justice. We have a national branch with the national relations in DC. It is a 501c3. The branches are C4, and that's important because the C4 allow us to become active. 
I am co-chair of the Legal Redress Committee, and we take on legal issues that come before the branch. For example, I'm glad to talk about voting issues because we just won one issue, and we're now having a second issue we hope we win on. We recently appealed uh, a statute that the legislature had, which would not have allowed anyone to go to the court to ask for extension as to the right to vote voting time. So that if you were in line and at six o'clock came and you weren't in the shoot, but you've been standing for an hour and an hour and a half, you could not go to the court and ask the court to extend for that precinct or for the county to vote. And the court disagreed and struck down the statute. We're now uh, bringing a second lawsuit in, in the state, along with the ICLU and Bill Groth, regards to your ballot. Because the way it stands now that if your ballot is not received by the clerks by 12 o'clock on the day before the election, which means October 2nd, then November 2nd, November 2nd, therefore your ballot would not be counted. And we're saying that's crazy, given that the clerk's office has no control as to when the mail is delivered. And specifically, as you notice in the last couple of weeks, there's been all of this issues about the post office, the ability to deliver mail, ability to de deliver ballots, when, the fact they cut the staff, they're not doing overtime. And so we're saying, Judge, that you're at the statute itself will bar a whole lot of people from being able to uh, participate by not having their ballot counted. Um, this afternoon, just recently, the clerk of the court, which is I'm saying ahead of time, just since I sent out the announcement, asking people if they get their ballot. And so I'm taking the point to make a point now, check your ballot. Because in the back of the ballot should be two signatures, or two initials, one from the Republican, one from the Democrat. And the clerk just admitted that they've sent out a number of ballots, people's called in, and you know, they've now have something that said like 30,000 ballots are sending out even more. That many ballots, you're going to have error. And so the problem is that they may not have signed the back of the ballot with both parties in issue. People mail the ballots in, and all of a sudden, their ballots not counted for an error that they did not create. So we may be going back to the courts to address that issue. But that's what the Legal Redress Committee do. We take on um, both issues, both political, legal in terms of voting, educational issues, with lawyers, with non-lawyers, people just believe in equal opportunity to the law. Thank you so much, Rod. That's really interesting. And, and obviously, thank you for your work. Uh, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions before I, I hand off to Oshia, and I'm going to start with a simple one, I think. I don't know, I'm not sure anything's simple anymore. Yesterday marked a week out from the voter registration deadline, as I understand. Um, Ashley, coming to you first, if you could give one piece of advice to someone out there who is not registered to vote, to get them ready, to make sure that if they want to cast a vote, they can, what would that advice be? My advice would be that I recognize there's a lot of reasons why, you know, voters might not be um, encouraged to, to really get involved in the process. It, it is a, a, a draining process. It can it be a lot, you know, it's in the news every day. It's in, um, it's been a topic of discussion for a long time, this election specifically. And, you know, there's so much around it and it, it can, I hear it a lot. They're like, Ashley, why do I vote if, um, you know, my vote doesn't count, my vote isn't going to make a difference. And what I would say is that every, every change we want to see starts with one person. So we all hold our own individual power as, you know, residents of Indianapolis, of Indiana. Um, we all hold specific power, uh, specific individual power, and voting is a way to express that. And it can be the first step. Um, to get involved in the process or a step to get involved in the larger process to see that that change. So I would encourage them to, you know, recognize their own power and recognize the power um, they have within their own community. Um, that is that is very, you know, we all hold it um, and and to get registered and encourage other people to get registered. Um, you know, in Indiana, it has to be a month in advance to register and in a in a perfect world, it'd be awesome to see, to be able to have, um, you know, same day registration and not have to, not have to do it, not have to have a barrier like that. Um, but I, I would encourage, you know, that is the system we're in now and I would encourage them to 
you know, if they have any issues registering to reach out to their county clerks um, and get in contact. Um, you know, there's, we have a lot of resources on our website, aclu-in.org on um, how to register to vote and who can register to vote. So definitely would encourage that and, and encourage people to talk within their loved ones and with their family members to, to talk more about like, if you're not registered, why aren't you registered? Um, you know, are you not excited about the process? Um, how can we talk about it and recognize the power that we do hold in our community and, and exercise that, that right to vote? Thank you, Ashley. And we will be going into the chat here momentarily to share some of the links and resources. And we will keep repeating that date. October 5th is the registration deadline. But Rod, I come to you with the same question. What piece of advice would you give someone in this last week before the deadline? First of all, go online and check your registration. I don't care if you thought you voted, didn't vote it, have voted, vote last precinct. I say that because my daughter who voted the last precinct because we both went to polls together, the last election, she went to check and lo and behold, her name was not on here. Don't know why, but she called the clerk's office and they said, well, we got you listed in the book, she said, but I went online, it's not there. And they went online, sure enough, wasn't there. So she they had to put it back on. So I'm saying, if you vote in the past, the last election, thought you voted, check your registration to make sure. Get it correct. You do not want to show up to poll and find out you can't vote. Second of all, grab everybody and anybody in your family, period, and go online with them. They say, let's go online. Let's see if you're registered. So if they give you some nonsense about I'm registered, it's very easy to check on it. And you can have them embarrassed right then and there if they're not said, I'm looking online and you're not registered. So let us register you right now. The tool of the internet is wonderful. If you can do a lot of things. Third, after you register to vote, go online and look at the ballots because people aren't paying attention as to the ballots. Not enough of the top of the ballot meaning the president. There's all the things underneath that. Two most important. Number one, the Supreme Court uh, justices are up for reaffirmation. You got to reaffirm them. They get to get, have to get a certain amount of votes to get reaffirmed. You can go on the line and read everything you can about the different Supreme Court justice and what you want to reaffirm them. In Marion County, they screwed up the Marion County process. Now the judges now are no longer elected. They're now reaffirmed. They're now appointed by a commission. And then every six years, they're reaffirmed. Meaning you go online and check the box that you want to re reappoint them by voting check on the box and see what the judges are. And you can read about each of the judges from the Bar Association, their opinions and everything about know who they are. I say that important to the African-American community. I've been around long enough to tell you that how we had to fight to get black judges. If you don't retain them, don't complain later because what happens is sequential numbers of votes does impact. And so if you have, for example, Mark, uh, 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 Pratt, who's now taken over and reformed the uh, traffic court. So as it's less punitive, much more because people are going to drive. They're going to drive to work and going to get stopped. And you think he's a good judge, you need to retain him. You need to vote on him. And third, school board. This is going to be a critical issue school board this year. The issue of equal funding. The issue of equal funding in terms of traditional public schools and charter schools is not new. But it's going to be even more important this year because of funding. With more people out of work, less money the state is taking in, you're going to have to figure out how to, how to pay the schools to stay in existence. But those who stay on top of the news you saw in Duval, who was trying to take all the money out of your support of education and send it to charter schools as a way of in private schools to maintain their stability. So that's going to be a critical issue. IPS is a good example. It will be a big issue about what is the future IPS? Will it be charter school? Will it be traditional school? Those are critical issues. So I'm saying to folks, when you vote, just don't go vote and ignore everything else. Those are critical issues we need to deal with. Thank you so much, Rod. So a really important reminder, both about checking your status and also about engaging down ballot. So I'm going to hand over to Oshia and go and share some of these resources in the chat. I know she has some good questions in the offing. Oshia? Oh, 
Oh, she, I think we've got you on mute. You still can't hear me? You got you. Okay, got me now? Okay. You guys hear me now? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So as you were talking, Rod and Ashley, I was just thinking about when I was a child. And voting seemed to be like the be-all, end-all. When you turned 18, you were, everyone was so excited to be to go vote. Um, didn't realize that when I got older, there was so much going on around voting that there seemed to be so many issues making it difficult for some people to vote. So you, you guys were kind of hitting on it. But I wanted to, you guys, to just touch on why should a person vote? Why is it so important to vote? Because it seems like people often say, why should I vote? My vote doesn't count. But then you have to count that with, obviously, it must count because there's a whole lot of people trying to make sure that you don't vote. So can you kind of hit on why it's very important for us to get out there and vote? And not just for the president, as you said, Rod, school board, judges, you know, you have, you have all these other people on the down ballot and we often only get excited about voting during the presidential election, but there's so much more going on uh, when it comes to voting. I'll start with you, Rod. Okay. It's kind of a timely question. I just had the discussion <laughs> last week, back last Saturday with my daughter and her, six of her friends. We were on a Zoom conference. And the discussion was, does my ballot count? And I have to remember, you know, that sometime I wanted to say, you know what, don't. But don't complain later when stuff happens. But then I had to realize that I need to take the time to explain to them. And so the first question said to me, I keep hearing, well, we had a black president, he didn't do anything. And I said to him, you know, if I was Obama, I told the black community, leave me alone. You elected him president, he told you, we had in school. The three branches of government that I realized, talking to one of my daughter's friends, they never had that in school. And I realized the generational about what I had in high school, in elementary school, but the branches of government, it's not being taught. So they didn't understand that when the president was elected as president, he only controlled the executive branch. He needed the legislative branch, Congress and the Senate. So when he asked everybody to show up in 2016, we didn't show up. We didn't understand the importance of maintaining the Congress. So he lost the Senate, and what did the Senate do? Block everything he wanted to do. So I explained to him that that's the power. Like it or not, this is the structure we have in America. And if you don't participate, you don't get anything. So I say to him, let's look at your streets. How many of you understand the important turn of your state, let your, your, your city county council, and how to reach them to make sure your streets get paid? You complain in Marion County, the northern part of Marion County, on Meridian Street and Illinois Street and 56th Street and 2nd Six Street all get paid. And they get paid because they know to do the second thing required as a citizen. A, vote them, but B, contact your elected officials and protest them and keep in tag with them. So that's the power of voting. It's just a voting point. Voters, I mean, the legislature wants to get elected and they look at votes. I say to people all the time that the minority, the majority party may win, but they look in terms of, of their candidate who lost how many ballots they got. Because they recognize if the trend is changing, they can lose their seat. They recognize the number that they got to kowtow to the minority party. And so the issue that you can't even win, but they look at the votes. And so that power makes people respond to you. That's why you vote. That's why you participate. Yeah, and I would echo a lot of the same things. I would say um, you really hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, voter suppression wouldn't be alive and well if um, your vote didn't count, right? Um, voter suppression is, is alive and well um, throughout the whole country. Um, and like I was saying earlier, you know, it, we have to register a month in advance. There are states that have same day registration who make it um, a lot easier to access the ballot. And, and we, we do have barriers here in Indiana. Um, and 
we also don't. Um, a big focus of our work is letting people know if you've been previously incarcerated, you have the right to vote in Indiana. We're only one of 16 states that allows that, um, that gives that right. Um, so if you think about it, the majority of states are cutting out an entire population of justice involved uh, citizens who don't have a say, who, who don't have access to the ballot or who can't vote. Um, so there's so many efforts and they're ongoing um, to make it harder to vote when voting is a right and it should be as easy as possible um, to vote, right? Um, so that's what I would say about um, how alive and well voter suppression is and that only reemphasizes the point of how important it is to if you if you do have that right to exercise that right um i think about my family a lot when when people think when people talk about voting um i'm a first generation american daughter of um really resilient nicaraguan immigrants um so you know growing up they weren't citizens and didn't have the right to vote. And there are 11 million undocumented residents in, in this country who don't have the right to vote too. Um, there are plenty of people who, you know, are in our communities, are impacted by the decisions our politicians make, but don't, aren't eligible to vote. Um, like I was saying, in a lot of states where previously incarcerated folks aren't, but in Indiana they are. So having that right to vote is so vital to to have a say in in participating in this um in our democracy and and exactly like how rod was saying it's a it's a step i mean it's it's not the the only thing you can do it's not going to be a one solution to everything because no one politician can fix everything right it's it's going to take all of us it's going to take um, us all being engaged at the ballot box, you know, during the legislative session with our state legislature, um, in our city councils, um, with our school boards, it's like at every level of government, they're making decisions on our behalf. And the more engaged we are throughout the whole process, the more our voice will be heard. Um, so voting is a step and an important step. And I don't think it should end there. I think it's a it's a great way to get people involved and get it get engaged, but to yeah recognize your power and and keep building on that power. Um, you know you can hold them accountable. What after you say you vote for someone and you um, you know really agree with what they said during their campaign and really agreed with what they're going to do. Okay, once they're in office, you can hold them accountable to that and say, hey, I voted for you because you said these things, are you actually doing these things? So it's, it's, a, it's a process. And then if they don't do those things, then you have the power to not vote for them the next time around. Um, and like I said, that's at every level, local, state, federal, we have representatives at every level that are elected to serve us and um, to, to hold, be held accountable as well. So that, that's what I would say to, to anyone who might feel, um, yeah, a little, hopeless in the in these times because it is easy to feel that way but it, I think it definitely does start with recognizing our individual collective power of, and how we can all uh, work together and, and like I said it's going to take all of us so I want to drill down on that for a minute Ashley we have someone watching on YouTube who had a question about um, justice system involvement and being formerly incarcerated and being able to vote. It, to be frank, seems a little antithetical to some of the other ways that we have voting barriers here in Indiana. So what are the specifics there? Um, if, if I am awaiting trial, if I'm on probation, are there specifics I need to know or my family members need to know about my voting status? Yes, yeah, so thank you for asking this. Um, this is a question we got a lot prior to launching our voting rights campaign. And we got this question so often after the election, right? Like after the fact, like, oh, I didn't vote because I have a felony record and I thought I couldn't. And I was afraid that, you know, I'd, I'd be put back in prison if I voted as that happened or has happened in other states. Um, so in Indiana, 
we are, like I mentioned, we're one of 16 states that allows um, people who've been previously incarcerated the right to vote. So individuals on parole, probation, home detention, in jail awaiting trial, all are, are eligible to vote. So if you're in jail awaiting trial, you can vote absentee. Um, if you're in home detention, you can vote absentee. If you're in a variety of community corrections programs, um, you can vote. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing that um, voting rights are restored, are automatically restored when you're released from jail or prison. Um, anyone who is justice involved should check their registration um, because if they you know, were recently in, in prison or in jail, it might have gotten canceled. So it's, it's good to check that registration once you're released and re-register if you need to. Um, but yeah, if, no matter, you know, no matter what your record might be, no matter if you had a felony record or um, any kind, you have the right to vote. And so, like I was mentioning earlier, that's the main focus of our, of our campaign is letting people know um, that, that that's their right. We have billboards across the state, we have radio ads, a video ad on some, you know, some television ads. We're really trying to, to let people know because there is a lot of misinformation out there because of how laws vary state to state. Um, and, you know, we even heard it from, from officials who, who really thought that was um, how it was here in Indiana. But, um, you know, yes, yes, you can vote if you have been um, previously incarcerated. Let me add on to that. As a POW broker, you don't realize that, that we turn citizens, I like that word versus ex-offenders, mm -hmm. we turn citizens. It is said that in Marion County, at least 60 people returned out of the hard cell, out of prison, to Marion County every day. You add that up per year. And all the folks who have returned to citizenship, that, if they were to vote to begin pushing reform as a block, if you thought you got misrepresented by because you thought the top defendant didn't have enough resources and couldn't do a good job, that's a voting block. You think the judge was unfair, that's a voting block. And so my response to the person who's raised the question is, why aren't you helping to organize the power you have to force the changes you think that are unfair to you? Things happen because you push it. No other reason. You say nothing, nothing changes. But you start a little pebble down the hill, it gathers speeds and gathers others with it. So my question to you or my instruction to you is, make sure you vote. Find all your friends that you knew that may have been with you behind the wall, probation, whatever. Make sure to vote and get to the vote and begin organizing themselves as, a, as an entity. Get involved because you have that power. And you, because of your experience, no firsthand. And therefore, when you talk about police reform, talk about bail reform, talk about talking to the judges, you had to build to say, let me tell you my experience and why I'm asking it. Every lawyer is trained as a lawyer to have empathy for your client. So when you start your case, you start your case by explaining your client and present it to, you, to the juror or to the judge, an understanding of your client humanity before you get to legal issues. I'm saying you had that ability. Use it. What a fantastic reminder. And I think at New America, and I know at The Recorder, we're both very committed to the ideas of racial and economic equity. And justice involvement is one of the great economic and racial equity questions of our time. And I'm going to go and share that stat, Rod. I think just think 60 people a day re-entering. That's a powerful, powerful thing. Oshia, I think you have another question. Well, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that and just say that is just very powerful. I never thought of it that way, that the people who are most affected by the criminal justice system actually can create a voting block to make change. And I think if we just talk about that to, to those people more, they will realize the power in which, they, in which they have as well. I just think that is just really, really amazing. Um, but I'm thinking about as we were, as we were talking about voting and absentee ballots and getting down there and the challenges now we have another challenge <laughs> we have a new challenge to voting um covid-19 
And there's a lot of talk about safety and voting. Will I be safe when we're voting? We know that Indiana will not have, uh, abs- there will not be an excuse for COVID on the ballot for absentee uh, voting. So there's still some concerns. We've been reassured by our elected officials <laughs> that we, uh, that, that this will be safe, even though it seems like the constituents want uh, it to be able, want to be able to absentee vote. Um, so how do we, what do we say to those who are very nervous about their safety and who don't want to go out because of COVID-19? Are we afraid that they, people may not turn out? Um, what, what are you guys hearing about that? I'll start with you, Ashley. Yeah, I would say definitely the pandemic has had an impact on, on access to the ballot. You know, we're already seeing, we're already seeing that across the country and we definitely saw it during the primaries as well. Um, So what I would say is to anyone who is unsure is to make a voting plan, is to walk through your voting plan and, and see what is the option that you, you know, you want to take. How do you want to vote? Do you want to you know, there's 12 reasons, I believe, on the absentee ballot that um, you can pick from on, um, you know, if you're 65 or older, if you're um, working the polls that day, if you don't have transportation on election day, there are reasons you can, you can pick on an absentee ballot. Um, And I would do that soon as possible, earlier, the better, um, because of, you know, issues with the mail, I would say, and the number of people um, voting absentee. So I would, and I would check with your county clerk to see if, okay, if you do get an absentee ballot, can you hand deliver it um, to them so you don't have to, um, you don't have to go to the polls, but you can, uh, or you don't have to worry about the mail and you can go and deliver it in person. Or if you're voting, um, if you're worried about long lines on election day, voting early and, um, you know, uh, vote early voting starts October 6th. Um, in Indiana, so there will be options for to you for to go vote early, and you know if you're worried about there being you know lots of people at the polls, you could go during a time where maybe not a lot of people are out there, um, and and figure out what your options are within your county um, because I think it I think it is yeah I think making a plan is the best route right now because there are so many options and because it'll look different for everyone. Um, I think figuring out what that plan is, but making sure you have some sort of plan so you follow through with that. So it doesn't come November third and there's um, you know something came up or something happened. Just making sure you 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 get your your ballot in um, in the way that you know, safest for you and um, the what, what's available to you. Can I get a dovetail on that? It's a, it's a, it's a, NHP right now, we're struggling with that same issue. Our initial response, we nation, national, or we went to ask people to go and get absentee ballot and send it in. And now we're struggling internally because we're seeing what the post office is concerned about if it doesn't get to, what does it do? Our governor did a form of, of voter suppression. I'll put it out there. If you remember, the precinct during the primary was pushed back because of fear of COVID. And so they pushed it back. The numbers, if you look at the day's number, it is almost equal to what the number was when they pushed the primary back. And he knew that. And he knew that two weeks ago, he made the announcement that they were almost a month ago. When it went to the election board, they said no. Now, here's a funny point. The election commission did not meet personally. They met by Zoom. And I'm saying, if you didn't meet personally, because you're afraid of COVID, why in the world would you subject the citizens of Indiana to vote personally? When you were afraid of meeting personally at the election commission, so you knew. And so the form was the president saying the number of voting by people not going. I hear this point turn to be in fear. The numbers, I've looked at the numbers in, across the state, except for Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, which had like maybe 12 cases, most of the places where people voted for it did not see a rise of COVID. 
And maybe because people are outside waiting a long line because the time period inside, but it weren't that large number. I understand the fear. Second, we've got six um, early voting sites. If you start going from the time the voting sites were early, the, look, the closer you get to November 3rd, the more likely people are going to have more people show up. The earlier you are, the less likely. Make a point go early in the morning, because most people don't like going early in the morning. Go so 9 o'clock, show up. I hear it. I hear your concern. All I can say is that this election is so critical. I saw someone online, someone on Facebook said that if I got to go in a hat mask suit, iron boots, iron gloves, a shield around me, I'm going to vote. Because unfortunately, I know every election we say is important. This one really is important actually to solve the nation and where we going. And so all I can say to folks is I hear it. Take your mask, take your gloves, take your chairs, take your lunch. But if you go early enough, you won't have to worry about that. And if you are going to do vote absenteeism, my point of being before you mail it in, check it. Make sure your name is signed, date is signed. Do not check a box until you're sure that's what you want because you can't check the box because you're spoiled the ballot. And by God, don't wait till the week before the election to mail it out. You get it today, fill it out today, put it in the mail. If you need to, have your daughter, son, cousin, next door neighbor, drag you down to the clerk's office and handle it. When the last election, the primary, there were people who showed up with the afternoon ballot. And so the clerk has said that they will have a line that if you have the afternoon ballot, you didn't mail it, then you can take it there and they'll handle it at the, at the election site. There really is no reason for you not to vote. I hear the fear of COVID, but do not let it drive you to the point that you don't participate and we have to then be sorry for the outcome of the election. That is sobering, but it's an excellent reminder. And uh, I think it would be great if you're online with us right now and you would respond with your own voting plan. What are your plans? Are you looking for help? Are you looking for a ride to the polls? Are you planning to take your chair, take your lunch, uh, send your granddaughter to turn in your ballot? I think those are important questions. So I wanna dig in on that a little bit in terms of voter suppression and the way that it can be covert and overt. And one of the covert potential voter suppression actions that you mentioned, Ron, is something we got a question about even before the event, and that's about judges. So I've voted in three different states in the 25 years I've been voting, and this is the only place I've ever lived um, with a similar approach to judges. And you mentioned that Marion County has changed their policy. The question we got asked, why do Marion and Lake counties have different processes for judges? And do we see implicit racial bias in those actions? And I wondered, Rod, if you'd be willing to speak to that. Answer is yes. The legislature decided, and, and I don't want to go back history, but it's important. When I first moved here in 1976, and I was young whippersnapper as a young lawyer and got involved in trying to elect black judges. The judges were then appointed by a committee. And you had to go through the Democratic Party and then the Republican Party, and then that commission decided yes or no when you appointed the bench. At that time, we had municipal court judges, superior court judges. And so we had a hard time getting African American and women appointed to the court. So we sued. So then it went to an electronic process where you voted in. That was a whole different ballgame to itself in terms of, you know, we said not getting bullet, meaning that. You made it one slating, but then somebody at the, at the, at the party level said, well, yeah, they made one slating, but don't, don't, don't elect them. Because the judge got elected by numerical numbers. So the popular narrative the numbers get you elected. But if you got less vote, you get a chance to got locked out. If you got the top vote, you got, you got the judgeship. And then the decision made that, well, we no longer want the uh, people because people don't know enough. They really don't understand the judicial process. They don't know the judges. So we're not going to let them elect him anymore. That was done by Republicans out of Marion County who got the state legislature so that South Bend, Fort Wayne, and Indianapolis are the only three cities. And interesting enough, those are three to have what? Democratic judge, uh, a mayor, 
and a large significant democratic population, a large significant African American population. And so the state legislature changed it. And because the voters here didn't pay attention, I said earlier, your elected officials pay attention to you. Have folks had called our Marion County representatives and say, don't you dare, because you do, we'll make sure you don't get reelected. That wouldn't have happened. So they changed it now, so now the judges are now appointed by a commission. And then they have every, every it, almost two years, you have the judges rotate off and you get reaffirmed, i.e. by the ballot. So you don't vote for them, you simply confirm or not confirm. So for example, if I'm up and I get the last number of, of, of votes, I may not get reaffirmed re, re the judge. But yeah, it was part racial. Because there was a push begin to push in terms of African American judges, Hispanic judges, Muslim judges. So we had a coalition begin looking at that issue of saying, how does the bench reflect Marion County? So we now got to figure out a new way or push back at the state legislature. But the answer to that is yes. Thank you for the insight, Rod. That's really helpful. Ashley, I want to come to you next because we've talked a little bit about voter suppression when it comes to racial identity um, and presenting race. There are other populations that we worry about a lot at a time like this in terms of suppression. And some of that's at the heart of the Yes, You Can Vote campaign. Can you tell us a little bit more about others that we want to make sure feel empowered to vote if they're eligible and wish to participate? Definitely. And yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, we our, the focus of the campaign is really to dispel any misinformation that there are that there is and um, really making it clear what voting rights, um, what your voting rights are in Indiana. Um, so also, if you're recently naturalized, um, ensuring people ensuring that people know that you have the same rights as um, you know someone born in the US, you are you're eligible to vote. Um, if you are a recently naturalized citizen. Um, I think that's, that's a big p key point as well, that there, a lot of this information isn't available in different languages. Um, and that's something really near and dear to my heart because, you know, if you're recently naturalized, you can take the citizenship test in, you know, in Spanish and other languages after a certain age. Um, and then it, then, what you you're eligible to vote, but you everything's in English. Um, I don't. I I think there needs to be better language access when it comes to voter information, um, and and at the polls too, because um, you can take a translator to the polls, but not a lot of people know that. Um, and I've done that before. I've translated for recently naturalized citizens at the polls before, and it really helps helps th that barrier of like. What exactly does this say? How, how does the process look like? I mean, the process to vote, the, the, how to vote, how you vote in other countries is very different than how you vote in the US, um, especially for a lot of Latin American countries, um, knowing from my own family. Um, so I think that's a population we try to, you know, all of our voting rights information is also available in Spanish to try to get that information out there to um, the Latinx community in Indiana. And then also, um, you know, transgender Hoosiers, knowing if your gender doesn't match your ID that um, you're still eligible to vote and you can, you know, your name uh, must match, but um, there are issues with photo ID, like voter ID laws are a form of voter suppression and that isn't talked about enough, I don't think, because um, they seem unobstructive, they seem like a small thing, but photo IDs, like government issued IDs, um, a lot of a lot of communities of color lack those. Um, so especially within, you know, that black community, that a lot of people don't have um, government issued IDs because even in Indiana, it might be free to get a state ID, but what's not talked about is the documents to, to get that ID. Um, and especially within, yeah, the trans Hoosier community, that, that's a big issue as well. Um, and then individuals with disabilities as well, what does accessibility look like at the polls and um, what are your rights to, you know, to exercise your right at the polls and making sure it's accessible. Um, so we have some information on that that we partnered with um, or some of our partners in Indiana. The Indiana Disability Rights, they have a hotline that, um, that, you, that 
folks, if they run into any issues, can call. And, um, you know, they have a team on hand on, on election day to help address issues there as well. So we try to push that information out on election day as well, um, because there can be a lot of barriers as well, and it's not talked about. So, um, so yeah, I, I would say sometimes people might assume that it's really easy to just go to the polls and vote, but that, that isn't the case for every community. And there are, there are serious, um, there are serious barriers, like I mentioned, um, with photo ID, with language access, with accessibility, and all of these, um, all of these really matter because a lot of the times voting is talked about, like, you know, folks just need to get more educated and, you know, just get involved, but it's not always that easy for everyone. It's not always that information isn't always available so or accessible. So I think that's that's a big um, part of our campaign too, is kind of trying to get that information out there and, and really meeting people where they're at because um, I, I really don't think a lot of people just don't vote just because they don't, you know, because they're lazy or, or, you know, misconceptions and assumptions that people think um, or they're uneducated. No, I think a lot of the time it's because voter suppression is alive and well today, as we were mentioning earlier. Oshia? Oshia, have we lost your volume? You lost me again? Am I back now? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> I have too many things going on here with trying to be on the phone and the computer at the same time with audio. So I was saying, Ashley, you made a lot of good points because I think we often think about voting in terms of how easy the access is for me to go. I did wake up and go. I know a lot of times when we were when the voter ID laws were talked about, um, there's a lot of feet pushback saying, well, it's easy to go get an ID. Well, maybe for you, but not for others. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I want to kind of talk about what do we do if we see something that's not right, doesn't seem right when we're voting? Where do, how do we address that? Yes, so what we push out, um, we're national partners with um, the Election Protection Hotline, which is 866-HOUR-VOTE. Um, it's a national nonpartisan election protection coalition that was formed to ensure all voters have equal opportunity and you know, can participate in the political process. So there's, it's made up of uh, about 100 state and national partners. Um, and the hotline's available in, in a lot of different languages as well. So um, I think that's a really great place to send people if they run into issues. And um, the Secretary of State's office, I also believe, has a hotline. Um, and as I was mentioning, the Indiana Disability Rights Hotline as well um, to address any issues. And um, we actually have a small graphic that we share through our social media accounts that um, kind of goes through all those different numbers on like who to call if you um, if your rights have been violated at the polls. And I wanted to reiterate that you can take a translator with you to the polls. Yes, I've- I think a lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. And how then do you get a translator if you don't know how to get a translator? Yeah, I don't think there's like a formal process um, as far as I'm, as I know. Um, I did it through, uh, you know, friends and family, but I believe, I, yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't believe there's like a formal process um, as far as like them, like the poll, polling location providing a translator for you. Um, but I do believe you can, I mean, I've done it. You can just go with, with someone so you can take someone with you. Mm -hmm. This is right. We have to use our friends. Our friend we have for, for, for some time was Myra, elder as the clerk of the court. Call her and her deputy and say, look, here's an issue how to resolve. A subtle suppression that used to be, hasn't seen in a while, but I remember that um, when George Bush ran and it was really, really hard push, and even Obama ran, we had to have discussion with the sheriff's department IMPD to make sure that they weren't hassling the homeless and taking the ID. So they would take the ID and then they go find it. I don't know how to deal with it. And then folks were trying to do all of a sudden 
couldn't find our ID and then trying them to vote. We thought that was part of voter, voter suppression. Um, the issue in terms of example, you're saying, how do we get an interpreter? I think it's called Myron Sanctuary. Look, I think she sent out instruction, but we could just send a, an email to us says, look, we're trying to make sure that for our various communities, what do they need to do? And are you going to send out instructions to your um, precinct captain when it's called the voting person, whoever's had the voting site? Because it's, it's going to be 161 voting sites. 161. That's a lot of voting sites in Marion County. So we only just sent a letter to Myra that says, how are you going to deal with two issues? A, folks who need interpreters, they can go in with them to help them vote. Or B, if they need to do it ahead of time, what's their process? And then how we make sure that either the person who's going to be the interpreter has been notified or the voter so we can get their resolve easier. I, th I think we can do that fairly quickly. We have friends in high places. Myra's easy to deal with. She's not going to rebuff you on it. She'll do that. Um, so sometimes we just need to use you know, our friends and have them resolve the issues for us. And uh, I think I need more friends like Rod uh, to help me <laughs> with these questions. So we, we talked a little bit about the concern in about kind of covert voter suppression in some of these COVID responses, as important as it is to, to protect ourselves and our most vulnerable neighbors. Um, one of the potential fallouts from that we saw yesterday in the news, which is that Indiana has had a steep drop off in the registration of 18 to 19 year olds the steepest decline from 2016 to the present of any state. Do you have some additional insight, and Ashley, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Rod, about what could be driving that? And do you have any advice for those of us who might encounter the odd 18 or 19 year old in our days and be able to maybe motivate them to vote? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if I have a, a great answer for that. I would say through my own community outreach, I would say something that, um, you know, a lot of people might not know is, you know, you can vote, you can register to vote if you're 17 and turning 18 by the time the election comes, you know, by the time it's, it's election day. So that's something I've stressed a lot, especially within our own, um, within my Latinx community here in Indianapolis is, because, you know, like, like me, I'm a first generation American, a lot of families are that way, you know, your, your parents might not be eligible to vote, but you are eligible to vote or are about to be eligible to vote. But something I talk about as well is, you know, growing up, I as a first generation American, I didn't really, I didn't go to the polls with my family and friends, like it, it wasn't an option for us, it wasn't an option to you know, as a little girl, you know, go to the polls and accompany um, my parents like some people do. So it wasn't necessarily like in our, you know, on our radar all the time. We weren't always talking about voting, definitely talking about what's happening and what was, you know, what was going on. But the actual like specifics of voting is something, um, you know, once my mom became a citizen, uh, you know, I saw her vote and then I learned from there. And um, that there might be a disconnect there too of, you know, or um, with families who, you know, aren't as engaged in the process because of voter suppression or because of other areas where it's, um, you know, maybe, maybe they work, oh, they work uh, long shifts and um, voting isn't necessarily a priority. So I think it's, I think it definitely goes deep because some, you know, some communities have more access to the polls as our whole conversation has been, um, which I really appreciate of, you know, kind of recognizing that and, and I think it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of like getting, getting that whole culture of voting um, into more of our communities because um, historically, I mean, we've been silenced and pushed out of the democratic process so much and all of the processes. Um, you know, we have to push for our rights to vote. We've, we continue to have to push for our right to vote. So I think that culture of voting can, it, it can be a lot, right? Like it can be, it can be a lot to figure out if you're an 18 year old and you're not necessarily talking about it with your family or friends, or, um, you know, it's all kind of new to you and, and you're starting to learn what the process is. So I think it's like, 
meeting people where they're at and understanding that, you know, it, it might be for a lot of reasons that why they don't know about the voter registration deadline or might, um, you know, never, never been to the polls with anyone before and might need to, um, yeah, get, get into like, get into the conversation of why it's important to vote and um, kind of the conversations we were having before recognizing our own power and, and exercising that power and, and voting can be a, a good step in it. But yeah, that's terrible news to hear that, that that's happening in Indiana. And I wish there was something, you know, that I wish there was like a silver bullet for it. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's very complex. This is, let me wrap, if I can dovetail. I think a couple things that's happened. One, COVID. Kids out of school. And so some of the mechanisms that you would have gotten starting for the primary, because you would have started getting involved in the primary in terms of um, getting participating, they used to get credit. A lot of schools used to have credit if the kids got involved in the election process, the primary process, voting day, they got credit for school. So that has changed a lot of that. I think generational has changed. I say it because when I, when, when I was president, branch president for 10 years, it was easy to be going to school because I knew the principals, I knew social worker teachers, I knew the social teachers, and they would have me come talk to the class or they would have politicians come talk to the class or they would have them go volunteer stuff. I don't know these new the, the teachers. I'm not sure that the younger teachers are pushing that. So that's changed. I think third, we rely too much on this. We keep thinking that that's gonna get the information out to folks in the old way in turn of the shoe and gum. We gotta get our shoes on the ground and go talk to them. And so we've gotten away from that. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I used to go with my mother to vote. My mother, my dad would leave to go to work at seven o'clock and poke open in New York at six o'clock. He would drag me with him because I had to go to school 7.30 with him, walk up to the pole place, and then go to cool school. My mother used to drag us, and we'd go to the pole place. So we, we learned to vote him by going. We had the old machine, you had to close it, you had to flip the lever stuff. And so you saw that. And she would explain to me us why she voted for who she voted for. In my community in New Jersey, public housing project, everybody voted. Everybody knew what to poll, and if you didn't, you got talked about. I mean, talked about. The bars that hang out when I, was, when I was in college didn't vote. You couldn't come in that day. They knew who went there. They knew because you, know, you, you know who your precincts. So you look to say, right, I didn't see the precinct today. So you can't come in to vote that the came people have a drink today. Goodbye. So there was a lot of public shaming that made you vote. Your community made sure you voted. Uh, folks who go together. And in my household, my kids were younger and they got 17, 18. I told them. No vote. I don't know what you're eating tonight, but you're not eating here. So my kids understood the consequence of not voting. And we spend time. My kids would tell you, they spend just as much as our term returns. Uh, we get together and we have discussion in politics. And so I think that what has gotten away from is having that discussion, having those social dinner discussion, having a discussion what's happening in the news and why and understand the connection. And so if we're going to do that, we have to do a bunch of things. And so I'm going to put some things in the recorder and say that you and TLC may have to start doing a whole new issue in terms of what is citizenship. Because they ain't being taught. People do not understand the role of government. They do not know the level of government. They don't understand how to call their own, priest, their own uh, 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 elected officials to the county council. You call and say, well, I don't know who that is. Well, how do I reach them? So we may really have to, after this election, spend an entire year from basic 101. And I'm going to end the story and turn to first one when, when I went to Cuba as a young kid in college, when it still was no legal to go to Cuba, we went. Cuba changed their literacy rate because they had on a billboard. And they start from A, and then you see an A, and then an apple. And then what happened was they took that word, and they broke it down you know, how to say Apple. And then they went to B and C and D. And it took them a whole year to do that as to getting people basic fundamental in terms of literacy. They did the same thing in terms of their health pregnancy. The picture was a, a side picture. A newly born, a, new, a woman who says she's pregnant, she's got family members all around her rubbed belly. 
the new she's new, and then they push down turns over a nine week period, the whole period of turn nine months. And in each of these, it was interesting watching. You could see all over, all over the island. One who was drinking, smoking, and one who was people who, who was not. And at the end of the campaign was one with a healthy baby, and the other one was present at the, at the cemetery. It was powerful in turn to saying to folks, which do you want? And so their literacy rate dropped, and the whole health issue changed. Because they did the magical numbers of putting in front of folks information and made you think. I'm saying, folks, we may have to go back to do that with our young folks in terms of understanding the power of vote and why they need to vote. And we may have to shame them. Because this issue, like I said, I spent you know, almost an hour and a half of Zoom with my, 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 my daughter friends. And I finally said to them, do you remember? I said, call, your, call your, your grandma and call your mom and ask them about birth control pill. And ask them how hard it was and how hard it was to get. And then I pulled up the article and said, do you remember this whole issue that came out a couple of years ago about the morning after pill? And I pulled up an article about why it all of a sudden disappeared. And I said to him, here's the lawsuit that has happened turned all across the country on black women who want their hair, their hair color, short haircut, ears in the ring, nose stuff, and employers are saying, I'm not hiring you. And I said, this is, so you don't want to vote. So when your employer comes and tell you how you need to dress, I'm not hiring you because I don't like your look. Don't come to me as a lawyer and complain to me about, can you sue? Because I'm going to say to him, no, you didn't vote. And so you let And I think we got to make it that plain to folks. You want to vote? Don't complain no food stamp. Don't want to vote? Don't complain no health care. Don't want to vote? Don't complain about your schools. Because your power to make sure you have is in your hand. And if you don't want to use it, we may have to be that hard nosed about it. I hate to say it. You know, I have friends of mine we discuss all the time as to some communities and some countries say if you don't vote. I was in South Africa a couple years ago voting. You didn't have your thumbprint. Guess what? Some of the public service that day, like some of the places that churches who gave food service your thumbprint. Sorry, you don't get served today. Because you didn't you didn't go vote. Now, when I first saw it, I thought that was harsh. But in retrospect, I understand what they were saying that you have, you have responsibility to participate in democracy. If you're not willing to participate in democracy, you shouldn't ask the democracy to support you when you're in need. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but that's my two cents. Rod, you brought up um, a couple, well, a lot of good points, not just a couple, but a lot of good points. Um, I was talking to someone who lives in Michigan recently, and they actually have um, students get involved and work at the polls. Do we have that kind of program in Indiana at all? Do students work at polls? Would yes. that be a way to get more youth involved? Yes, Myra loves it. She, a lot of schools have them. That's what I'm saying. The problem with COVID is the ability to get in, to get the information, and get people in has changed. Because she's been a good See, I've never heard of such a program ever. Oh, no, I've oh, no, never we, heard about no. it. Oh, yeah, we have. We have. <laughs> When I was pretty in the and you used to have kids all the time go work the post. A lot of schools gave kids the day off and got credit. So they got credit for doing so. Um, we don't have the money now, but at one time when I was pretty in the we had money put, that people church gave us, and we paid people stipend to go work the post. So there was a lot of program for used to work at the code. A lot of politicians would go recruit. Um, I know that, for example, internships that the, that the legislature have, both Republican and Democrat, at the state legislature, you intern. A lot of it came from kids who got involved in working at the polls. And then they would say, well, you want to be an intern with me this, this, school, this, this semester? Oh, sure. And so one day a week, they went down to legislature. But that's how they came out. And that, so a lot of the politics you now people about in politics, you talk to them, they'll tell you they got interested working at the polls. It's a basic level of understanding. So there are programs to do that. The problem is what we have to now do is have a discussion with our superintendents and say to our superintendent, where is this program? Why aren't you pushing it? Be comfortable at your, at your school district to make sure that every kid who's a junior and senior is participating. That's the fundamental thing we have to do. It's just what I said, we're going to go back and change and not keep assuming 
that this instrument is going to educate folks because it's informational, but if you know how to use it, it's useless. I agree. And I'm also on board with you with the whole educating people on how to be a good citizen. I have been talking about this for the last probably six, seven months about ways to, to make sure that people recognize what you can do because, like you said, people don't know who to call. They don't know where to go. They complain to each other. That seems to be the thing that you do is you complain to each other, but you never complain to the right people to actually do something. Like you mentioned, streets of Meridian getting paved while streets, you know, 38th Street, Sherman, Sherman Drive never gets paid. You know, how do we fix those problems? And it's because you need to talk to the right people to make it happen. You need to vote for the right people, first of all, <laughs> and then you need to make that happen. I think, is that, do you guys think that is part of the problem? We don't see the connection of elected office to our daily lives? Yeah, I would say, I would say there is definitely a disconnect and, you know, I would kind of push back a little bit on, on the idea that, you know, some people are just misinformed and just, um, you know, need to be shamed into voting. Um, I'm, I'm of a different opinion. I think that, you know, it's, it's, if you don't see yourself represented in your government, um, it is it is easy to get discouraged and um, not in no interest in getting involved. I I kind of see it a little bit more as we really have to meet people where they're at. Um, if you don't see yourself represented in in your government, if you don't have a lot of faith in your government why would you get involved? Um, I think we have to kind of take a step back and look at the bigger picture and say, there are a lot of systemic issues um, that we need to address that aren't going to be solved by voting um, one time in one election. It is a longer term um, fight and it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And to get people involved in that marathon, I think, it, yeah, these vital conversations need to be had where it's you don't necessarily, you you kind of come at it with a little bit more compassion and say, hey, I, I recognize where you're coming from. I recognize that there isn't a lot of representation in our government. There has been a lot of um, disappointments. And, and I understand that you, you know, might feel powerless and feel hopeless. It's like, how can we build power together? How can we build community together? And how can we all educate each other together in a way to meet people where they're at and say, um, you know, if, if, you know, if there is a disconnect, if our elected officials, um, you know, only reach out to us every four years or every time they're elected or every time they want, you know, they want your vote, but don't really talk to you any other time, then um, how can we, how can we start addressing those issues and how can we, um, make sure they are reaching out to us and they are, um, you know, talking about our communities, our neighborhoods, our streets, out like how can we make sure we're a priority on their minds as well um, and making sure it's like that's the fight that we're in and it's, it's, it's not just, I, I kind of see it a little bit more complicated, like it's not just like a oh, I'm disinterested, I'm disengaged. It's, it's like, I, f I don't feel a sense of belonging within my government. And I think that's, that's the bigger issue. And especially in, in, in the immigrant community, I think a lot, a lot, a lot of that happens within the immigrant community because um, you aren't taking into it, you aren't being taken into account a lot of the times and decisions are being made on your behalf, but you don't really necessarily feel represented in those decisions. So um, for recently naturalized citizens, for, you know, folks who, you know, are going to be first time voters, I think there's a lot to be said that of recognizing our individual and collective power and building community together and, and kind of recognizing why people are where they're at and not making assumptions of, you know, people are or this or that, I think it's just like having those honest conversations. And even if they're a little uncomfortable, getting a little uncomfortable and saying, 
and recognizing that, yeah, like, like we've been saying, it, that process looks so differently for everyone. So thinking about meeting people where they are, there are some very basic premises that we've covered to get people registered, but let's take it all the way down to ground level. Make sure we meet people where they are. If I have never registered to vote, Ashley, I'll start with you. What do I need to gather and take and where do I need to go before October 5th? Yes, so you want to go to indianavoters.com. That is the location where you'll have all the information to register to vote. You're gonna want uh, your state ID, um, Indiana state ID if or st Indiana state driver's license should register there. If you don't have either of those, you'll have to register through the federal form. Um, and you can do that in, uh, through like, your, directly with your clerk's office or there's, um, you know, we've been pushing people to, you know, Common Cause, which is a, a, a partner of ours, has a register to vote tool on their website um, that you can use alternate forms of ID. So, um, yeah, having a, having a, a ID, because that's required in Indiana, if it's a state or um, federal issued ID. Um, you can also vote at the polls with um, a student ID from an Indiana state institute, from a state institution, like a state university, um, if it meets all the requirements of having like your, your, your name, your picture, your an expiration date. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's what, that's important to know. Indianavoters.com is where you'll go to get all of that information, get registered, see who's on your ballot, like Rod was mentioning, so important, so, so important. And um, seeing where the voting locations are in your in your county and, and figuring all of that out. You you set me up perfectly, Rod. I want to come to you. Where where do I vote? So um, this has actually changed a little bit here in recent years. So let's say it's it's November and I don't vote early, although you can starting October 6th. Where on earth do I go? All right. If you, before November 3rd, there's six, there's six uh, voting sites, early voting sites. And I don't know them offhand, but I can get that to you. Uh, the only township, I think, Pike Township and Franklin are the only two that doesn't have them. But you can either go age, Drive downtown to the clerk's office from 8.30 to 5 every day. And I think she's doing the weekends also. You can early vote. And all you need to bring with you is your ID. And a uh, driver's license, identification card. If you have a military ID, which is interesting, military IDs is recognized. There was some discussion whether a hunter and, 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 and a hunter's license or uh, Gun registration with, with, with a form ID, but I would not get that, that issue right now. Just simply ID, take it with you, you stand in the line, and it's fairly quickly, and you can vote. On election day, there's 161 sites, and I know that Myra will be printing them out in, this, in the newspaper, IBJ, Star, I believe she will also record is going to have all the sites. On the NHP website, I think the ACLU website, I think the Urban League website, Probably quarter wise that will have listed. On that day, you're going to have a bunch of folks. I know the legal women voters will be uh, open. I know the NSP offer will be open. I think the ACO offer will be open. I think the early offer will be open. I think uh, women for change. The variety of folks are going to be open. You're going to say, what do you, here are the sites that will be able to tell you what site is closest to where you live at that you can go to. 161 sites. Um, and so that's what you're doing the voting day. Take somebody which has already voted. Go with somebody who's, who's already voted. So there's non-intimidation. And so they're in line with you. They go the process with you. They walk through with you. You can see them. And you can, I've done that uh, the last election. Primer, I took somebody who didn't vote with me, who never voted, one new primer, and I had them walk with me. And I explained to people, hey, she's never voted. And they said, okay, and I sat next to them. They went through stuff with them, kind of kept them calm. And then they went to the voting booth and I went to my voting booth. And then the woman said, if you need any help, I'll come help you. So they wouldn't let me do it. Said, my law, they couldn't. And that was done. So it takes my to voted just so you have somebody on that day to kind of chat with you, kind of walk you through the lead your fear. Um, 
And it really is not that complicated. It really isn't. It's just simply going prep time, finish the time. You know the times at which people are going to, well, it may change this time because of the election. But normally, early morning, you get a, a early sluts between the 6 o'clock to about 7.30, people who are going to work. And then by 7.30, about 9, it's kind of slow. And then you get the next group. And then you get a group of people by lunchtime. And usually from about 1 to about 3, it's kind of slow. And then from three on to seven to six, seven, six, it's, it's swamp time because people come up with, so you got to just gave, but that may change because of the importance of the election that it may be steady all along. And that's why I keep saying, go early, go to early voting site. It'd be less stressful, get in and out. But it's not that complicated. It isn't like a lot of places. And you, other than sign your name, verify your name on the registration, that's it. Now, the question becomes, if you get there, what do we do in terms of if you get there and you're not, you can't find your name or something like that? Then you ask for a, um, can't think of the name, the ballot. It's, um, this is a federal election. You can fill out the, ask to help me out, what's the ballot for? The provisional ballot? It's a ballot, yeah. yeah. Well, the provisional ballot. Um, and that will allow you to at least vote for the, um, I know there's been discussion about having provisional ballot also do everything. That's not being clear to the election board yet, but at least for the presidential stuff, you can vote for the presidential election on the provisional ballot. So that will allow you to put it, it gets put aside. I've done both in terms of a counter, I've done as a precinct committee person, I've done in terms of, you know, countered the whole nine yard in terms of voting stuff and the whole nine yard in terms of the election process. So I, you know, but you at least can vote. So what we need to do is probably uh, begin stressing folks if you show up what you ask for. You probably recorded, probably need to get together with the with TLC and then stress folks. If you show up and you're sure that you've registered to vote, ask for this form and at least vote it. And at least they'll, they'll put it aside and then check the register to vote and see if they find you then their the ballot get counted. But at least you don't walk away and say, sorry, just walk away. That's so helpful. And we'll be putting all of these tips together in a guide, including some of the resources that folks have been sharing here and on Twitter. So Ashia, I want to come to you to ask the last set of questions as we near the end of our time. Yes, I wanted to make mention that I did put in the chat, the recorder recently put a little guide of where to vote. Um, we published a little guide so you can kind of cut it out, keep it with you, put it in your wallet, put it in your purse, carry it, pass it around, copy it, screen, take a picture. Send it to your friends so people know we listed the boat, the uh, early voting sites, time, deadlines, absentee deadlines for to, to apply to vote, all that good stuff. So it's a little handy dandy little guide that you can keep with you. We want to we wanted it to be a friend to voters. <laughs> so we kind of made it short enough so that you could keep it with you. Um, I just want my last question is it's not really a question, it's kind of a conversation more. I wanted to kind of you guys to kind of share a voting story with our audience, um, like something that stands out in your memory of your, maybe your first time voting or a great uh, experience in the voting booth. Um, I know for me, we were talking about taking your children. I've always taken my children into the booth with me. I guess I did miss a part when I didn't tell them who I was voting for or why. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I always took my children, especially when we actually had booths. My children are 13 years apart, so my son could actually go into the booth and see me push the lever, and it's been a lot different for my daughter, but that's one of the great memories I have is like going into the booth with my kids. Um, I didn't do that with my parents. I know they voted, but I never went with them, so I wanted to share that experience with my children. So I just wanted to kind of hear from you guys some a great voting story that you had. Well, I'll start with not a voting story, but important. why I learned important to vote. Um, I've already voted from the time I was able to vote. My family voted. But Newark, I took it for granted. My senior year at Seton Hall University, we had to do a senior project. And so myself and five other folks decided to go work and vote in campaign. We went to Mississippi. I went to work with a fellow named Dr. John Connor, who was trying to get elected as the first elected black state senator since Reconstruction Mississippi. And I saw firsthand the whole year that we were there. So we were doing classes, sent to by mail, and then you send it stuff, they had all the curriculum stuff. 
while we were doing William Strasser stuff. And I saw the suppression. I'm talking about when folks walk up the same. Sally Mae, does your employer know that you're not here trying to vote? Or Steve, don't you get paid tomorrow? You don't want that paycheck missing, do you? So you saw the, the intimidation to turn the truth to people to vote. You saw when you try to take him into the, uh, uh, the registry office and he would close that day, or we're having lunch, come back two hours from now. So the kind of impediment that we saw over and over trying to people to vote and the direct intimidation. We had almost got charged with sedition. And for those who know sedition means treason is the state. And they wanted to charge them saying that we were sedition because we were trying to register people to vote. And Jack Greenwood, who was then, who's passed away, Greenberg, who passed away, who was a well-known lawyer with the um, Legal Defense Fund, had to come into state and said that the act of thinking to vote is a protected act under the Voting Rights Act. And that, to me, gave me as an understanding of the power to vote and suppression of vote and why you voted, because I realized then as a college student, that the folks are going out of this way to intimidate. And even for us to come and try to help people vote because they want to run, be elected. That told me that this important to vote, that there must be something in it for people to behave the way they behave. And so that's part of the reason I'm so passionate about voting because I saw it. And that has stayed with me for you know, 50 years. Well, I don't have a great story like that. Um, for for me, I think I kind of already mentioned it is when um, I was able to translate at the polls for, um, you know, some first time recently naturalized voters um, that that for me kind of just went full circle, um, you know, talking about within the immigrant community, how, um, you know, when a lot of decisions are made on your behalf, but once you are, you're able to have that right, um, if if and when you know you become a citizen and you have the right to exercise it, it's so so powerful. Um, I think about like during that time when I was able to help you know folks get uh, understand what's on their ballot and vote and all of that. It, it it is such a power. I understood in that moment just how powerful it is to be able to have that right because like I said, I mean, there's so many decisions that are made on our community's behalf that we don't get to have a say. Um, and then when you do have that right, it's so powerful to say, um, you know, this is my decision. This is me speaking on, on behalf of my community and um, on behalf of also a lot of folks who, who don't have the right yet. So, or don't have the right to vote. So I think that that was the moment for me that was during the 2018 midterm elections and um, seeing so many people come out to vote during that time was was really powerful too because people were really engaged um, in a midterm election when you know that doesn't usually happen it's usually presidential elections when when people are like oh i gotta vote again it's been it's been four years but um no I, elections happen really frequently and and getting involved in that process and um yeah I think that that was a powerful moment for me to realize that like as a first generation American, I have a lot of power and privilege and um, off on to speak on behalf of my community as well and with my community and um, voting for for people who might not have the right to vote as well. Um, but still, you know, I know I know what my family uh, believes in and, and kind of what we're all fighting for together. So um, I think that's, it's just so powerful to be able to, to exercise that right. And, and like I was saying earlier, it's the, it's the first step, it's a step uh, of a longer process with um, longer civic engagement that we can all have and hold our government accountable and hold them um, accountable to really represent our communities. 
Well, I'm not sure anyone could have a last word uh, better than Rod and Ashley just did. That was an excellent question, Oshia. We are going to go ahead and wrap up this conversation. We are so grateful, uh, certainly to the Indianapolis Recorder for their continued partnership. Oshia Boyd is the best co-moderator in the business, and I was so honored to have her with me today. Uh, Rod Bohannon, the co-chair of the Legal Redress Committee for the Greater Indianapolis NAACP, thank you for your perspective as, as a person and as an activist. Ashley, as an activist and a professional from the Indiana ACLU, we are so lucky to have you as well. If you are joining us today or with us on YouTube or watching this after the fact, I hope that you'll watch newamerica.org slash Indianapolis for this video, uh, for highlights from this video, and you can catch highlights from this event at the hashtag YesYouCanVote hashtag Indiana. Uh, please do watch the work of the NAACP, the Indianapolis Recorder, and the ACLU of Indiana for more voter protection tips. We hope you'll share your voter plan and voting stories with us. You can reach me at at Molly G. Martin on Twitter or at martin at newamerica.org. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you again to my guests, my co-moderators, and our partners, and don't forget to vote.